Get protected today at shieldmutual.com. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Arm Your Mind for Liberty podcast, episode two. My name is George Donnelly, and I'll be the one who will drone on to you on drone on and on to you over the next 20 to 30 minutes. Or even 40 if I'm feeling particularly energetic. Well, it's a beautiful day where I am. And uh, I'm looking at a gorgeous green bamboo forest. And it's uh, nice and comfy, the nice temperature. And I'm feeling good. You know, um, life is a precious thing. We only get a limited amount of it, although I plan to um, live to at least 120. I've promised my son that. We have to enjoy it. We have to live in the moment. We have to appreciate it even when things are hard, and that's not easy. But I would like to recommend a book while we're on this topic that's called The Power of Now. Uh, I have it in PDF, uh, so if you'd like it, you can, uh, in that format, you can shoot me an email at uh, me, me, at georgedonley.com, and I'll be happy to send that along to you. But, you know, of course, it's a very popular book. You can buy it at Amazon or at your local bookstore or whatnot. Basically, this book is about appreciating. It's, it's not just about appreciating. It has concrete exercises for how to appreciate the present moment and always live in it. How to be more conscious. You know, in the Liberty community, we talk about, uh, you know, wake up. Be conscious. You know, know what's going on. You know, wake up, statist. Wake up, you status drone, right? Some of us can, you know, wake up, sheeple. You know, some of us know how to say that in pretty rude ways. I don't like that myself. And frankly, um, I don't think it's very useful. But I think it is very useful to say to myself, I've come pretty far. How much farther can I go? How much more can I wake up today? And I think that's where techniques like uh, meditation, which is basically living in the present moment, um, um, demystifying meditation, for me, that's basically what it is. Um, That helps a lot. It has helped me a lot. And, uh, you know, there's a uh, a dojo that I go to um, once, twice a week to meditate uh, with someone who's been doing it for more than a decade. Really nice guy. So if you can find a spiritual practice, a place to practice your meditation or living in the movement, it's even more powerful. But you don't have to. And you don't need special equipment or a special place to meditate or live in the present. You can do it anywhere, anytime, in any position, anyhow you like. So I do recommend The Power is Now. uh, Huh? The Power is Now. The Power of Now uh, by Eckhart Tolle, T-O-L-L-E to help you perhaps achieve a more positive outlook on life because everything's a lot more fun when you're positive. All right, so uh, today's show, I'm going to give you a quick update on uh, my son's unschooling. My son is seven years old. He has uh, never been to school. Um, I think more people should unschool. This is why I'm, I'm going to talk about it more frequently. Uh, actually, um, you know, the, his mother didn't really understand unschooling at first. I, I didn't either. And I have to credit the Free State Project and Liberty Forum for um, turning me on to the idea. In 2009, I attended a talk. Actually, it wasn't Liberty Forum. I went because of Liberty Forum, but it was, it was the Alt Expo where uh, there was a mother who was talking about how her she was doing unschooling with her kids. And it just blew my mind because... Uh, I I went to schools and I never conceived that you could not send kids to school. I wanted to send my son to the best schools. What a joke. The best schools are still crap. There it is. I'm saying it straight out. And so I have to credit the Free State Project. I'm I'm critical of them fairly regularly. Um even though I am a member and I was very close to moving once. I actually uh own land in New Hampshire. I was uh, six days away from moving when I was arrested and framed by uh, U.S. Marshals in Allentown, Pennsylvania, put under house arrest for six weeks and faced uh, a eight, uh, possible eight-year uh, prison sentence, all for video recording. So uh, just to get my 
my bona fides out there, you know, before I criticize them. I'm not afraid to do it. I, I have criticized the Free State Project people, and I'll do it again. But I do have to give them props, because in 2009, um, they do do a lot of stuff, and they brought me to New Hampshire. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, the Liberty Forum event is uh, a place where things can happen. And um, I found out about unschooling. And, but I, I, my wife, my, um, my, my, my son's mother, um, she didn't get it at first, and she wanted to send them to kindergarten. It was actually more like, um, what's that, daycare. Yeah. She wanted to send him to daycare so he could socialize. He was about three at the time. And I s said that he should give it a try, you know. Uh, and he tried it. He tried it for about three days, and then he said, I'm never going back. He just didn't like it. And I supported him in that, and I'm very glad that I did. And he's never gone back. And every once in a while I tell him that, uh, because I've expressed my own opposition to schooling, and I tell him that it doesn't matter uh, that I don't like it. He can always go back and give it another try because he has friends. All his friends go to school. It's unheard of for kids not to go to school uh, where I live. Uh, but he doesn't want to. He is a fierce proponent of unschooling. And um, he's, he's learning reading. He's learning math. Um, you know, it's, we're basically following his interests. And we negotiate the curriculum. Uh, you know, it may have some aspects, looking at it uh, dispassionately, some aspects of homeschooling. And we bring in some curriculum and, and texts and whatnot from people who sell homeschooling stuff. Um, but everything is negotiated, and it's all based on his goals, what he wants to do. For example, he wants to write his own video game. Uh, you know, ever, all kids love video games, and this is the reason why uh, some people have told me they don't want to try unschooling because they're afraid their, their child will just play video games all day. Because uh, unschooling is basically the idea that kids follow their own interests and um, make their own path, um, do whatever they like in order to learn. Give your child complete freedom. Uh, homeschooling is the idea that you import the school into your home, to, which could be super strict or, or not so strict. And uh, basically, um, you know, all you unschooling proponents are right. My son wants to play video games all day. But I think if you uh, can relax, you'll see that that is useful. Because I said, you know, what do you want to learn? I see you playing video games all the time. I'm a little worried. Don't you want to learn something? He said, yeah, I want to learn to make my own video game. Excellent. All right, well, in order to do that, first you need to learn how to read. You need to learn how to write. Do math. How about we make a deal where you work on those things, and when you're ready, I help you with the computer side of the video game. Deal. We shook on it and all. And uh, that's the path that he's going on. He has uh, open access to my iPad. I get him apps, new apps all the time. There are lots of great apps on the iPad for unschoolers. Uh, I'll make some recommendations in the future. He has open access to Netflix. He has video games. In fact, you may hear him yelling in the background because he's playing uh, a new video game that I just got him today. And uh, he does uh, martial arts and other stuff. So he lives a pretty fulfilling life, you know, for a seven-year-old kid. So anyway, it's going like gangbusters, and perhaps you should try it as well. And it doesn't mean that you immediately have to pull your kid out of school. It just means you could incorporate more respect, more listening, and more activities that the, the child, him or herself, generates into the things you do with your, your child. Now, it's hard. His best friend goes to school a very well-regarded school, private school, and he and his parents are very strict, and he spends this child at least 11 hours a day either at school or doing homework. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible, and the kid is fed up with school. And he, basically, his only escape from all of this um, dreariness is to come and play video games with my son in, uh, at our house. I kind of feel sorry for him. But it, my point is that in a situation like that, it's kind of hard to find any time to experiment with anything. And so you may have to pull your kids out of school in order to experiment with unschooling. But I encourage you to do it. Just do it. It's all about freedom and respect and trust. Trust your kids.
I have a little video I did, a two-minute video I did about trusting your kids on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash George Donnelly. So uh, I'd like to talk about rules and regulations. And I'll show you a video clip here about a gentleman who is very well regarded in the Liberty community, Jeff Berwick. I'm Facebook friends with him, and we've talked before, and I have a lot of respect for him. Um, uh, so I don't want to make it seem like I'm singling him out or, you know, dissing him or just ripping him to pieces, you know, behind his back while he's not paying attention, because I, I have a lot of respect for him. However, in this interview, Jeff is talking about how anarchism is... People perceive it as being no rules. And that's not true. It's not no rules. It's no rulers. There are rules under anarchism. This is, this is a thing that's going to be um, challenging for people to understand. And I'll talk about it in the future. And I'd love to hear your questions about it. Because um, you know, it can be confusing. Uh, and so he's saying anarchism is not about no rules. Rules are good. But then uh, just a few seconds later... They're talking about business, and so rules, but no rulers, that's an anarchist talking point. That's something anarchists and libertarians should be talking about, um, because that's a, a common misunderstanding. But then they get into regulation of business, and you know, we're, now we're getting into uh, conservative talking points, you know, rightist talking points. No regulation, deregulate, stop regulating, you know, and... Um, Sadly, Jeff says, yeah, all, essentially he says, in so many words, all regulation is bad. And uh, this was kind of a facepalm moment for me. And I, I've talked about this elsewhere. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you listen to my Art of, the Art of Liberty podcast, you may um, uh, feel, face, you may be facepalming yourself right now. But it's a point that's very important to repeat, in my opinion. Um, because often uh, we anarchists and libertarians uh, get stuck in rightist ways of thinking. We have to get beyond that. Um, and so basically he says all regulation is bad. And, and you know what? What is regulation? It's just rules. It's just making rules. It's, and again, it's, it's the same point that Jeff just made. It's not about no rules. It's about no rulers. Business... And I was in a shopping um, uh, supermarket line once, and I overheard a couple of ladies talking about how business must be regulated. And um, they were obviously statists, probably on the left, and um, they were absolutely correct. Business must be regulated. Everything must be regulated because what is the flip side of liberty? It's responsibility. And you know what? Liberty can't function without responsibility. If we want complete liberty, we also have to have complete responsibility. And that's basically what regulation and rules are about. It's about holding people accountable and having responsibility. Um, business must be regulated. There must be regulation. It's just a matter of who is making the rules. Uh, and I'll touch on that in a future episode. But I, I just want to make this point clear. And don't talk about deregulation. Uh, whenever I hear anarchists and libertarians talking about deregulation, I just, you know, I want to facepalm again. Because deregulation in mainstream, um, in mainstream conversations, it means remove all the limits on business, but still keep all the government, special government privileges. And this allows business to profit from government aggression allows them to run free and unencumbered from responsibility. What we need is to remove both the government special privileges and the um, and keep the responsibility, but from a, um, a meaningful way. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a future episode. So um, you know, Jeff should be listening. Uh, Oh, another thing, yeah, so if Jeff listening, I'm not trying to harp on him. It's simply an important point that we all need to understand. And also another thing, um, getting back, so with a reference to my to episode uh, number one of this um, series, where I talk about ego. A lot of us are on ego trips, and ego um, cannot really be defeated. It just has to be kind of put in its proper place. 
And the meditation and the power of now uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of this episode are great ways to do that. And basically, they talk about Adam Kokesh and which, which one is uh, more alpha. And, um, you know, this is another masculine thing, another excessive, tos- ex- you know, excessive tos- testosterone, you know, and an ego thing. Uh, you know, this whole concept of alpha and, you know, I'm the big bad guy with the tie and all that stuff. That, you know, like, just chill out already. You know, l- let's stop focusing on who's more alpha. Let's focus on, um, you know, how we can work together uh, to raise all the boats, you know, to raise, every, to raise the tide so everyone's boats go up. And this is something when I was growing up that I liked in um, conservative talking points. I was a a conservative. I was a fan of Jack Kemp. And he talked about how, um, you know, the free market can be a, a rising tide that lifts all boats. Maybe that was Reagan, too, but I think he probably got it from Kemp. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that we need to focus on. Instead of all me, 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 I'm more alpha, you know. Um, we need to focus on, you know, let's work together. And that's something I've been trying to do recently. Uh, a lot of my projects I've been doing by myself. But, uh, for example, recently, uh, you know, I'm looking to partner more with people. Uh, the Art of Liberty podcast that I do at AYMFL.com slash T-A-O-L. Those are the initials for Arm Your Mind for Liberty and uh, the Art of Liberty. I partnered with John Tyner, who's a really nice guy, a uh, family man. I, I like him a lot. And uh, from Shield Mutual, um, before I kind of uh, gave it a good kick in the butt, um, maybe a month or so, I was looking for people to partner with. Uh, to just bring in his full partners. Um, unfortunately, I, I was unable to do that. I'm still the sole owner of uh, Shield Mutual, proud owner. And actually, one of the people that I invited uh, to come in uh, said he was gonna gonna do it, and then suddenly said no, and went off and started a competing service. Uh, it's kind of ironic. Um, I'm not saying he didn't have a right to do that. He can do whatever he like. I just felt that it was. You know, it may be in this vein of being egotistical and not being cooperative. But um, the, I respect this person. Um, but I, that kind of, you know, stuck in my craw. But anyway, um, I'm looking to partner with more people on my projects, to work closely together with people. And I think you should be too. Uh, what, what is liberty about except to work together more closely with each other, to build businesses and do fun stuff? You know, let, let's... let's Let's try to get off our, our, our individual ego trips so much. And this may be an American thing as well. It may not just be a masculine thing, but an Amer- American thing. So anyway, uh, moving along. I saw an interesting a video uh, recently by Adam Kokesh, who is a liberty activist that, um, that I respect a lot. I met him for the first time in 2009, again at uh, Liberty Forum in New Hampshire of the Free State Project. Kudos to the Free State Project people. Um, you know, uh, he, he's, he's, you know, he's, and I'll get into it in this video. I, I have a lot of respect for him because you know what? There are a lot of people in this movement who, for whatever reason, talk a good game but don't actually do much. And even when people do things that I think are a little bit misguided in one way or another, um, in whole or in part, I have to applaud you, you doers, for doing it. Because so many of us are not doing things, and we're, we're not doing enough things. Um, you know, because it's one thing to... Um, there's stages to this liberty evolution that a lot of us have gone through. There's the, the stage kind of zero, where we're kind of stuck in either apathy or statism. There's another stage where we, we're kind of accepting it, uh, accepting libertarianism, accepting freedom. Uh, there's another stage where we may talk about it. Um, and that, that's a really important stage because talking about it is not doing nothing. Talking about it is doing something. Talking about it, writing about it, that's definitely doing something and something very important. And uh, you may even be sitting on your couch while doing it and getting fat, but you're still doing something very important. And then there's going out and doing things like cop blocking, <clears throat> uh, confronting uh, bureaucrats and tyrants of whatever level. That's another level because that's actually going out and doing stuff, not just talking. Talking is very valuable. 
And uh, my, those people who go out and do that, my respect increases for you, even when I think you're misguided. But the people who actually go out and move on to the next level of doing something constructive, focusing less on the problem and more on solutions, you have my utmost respect. Um, and I think Adam is basically at the talking about it and action stage. Um, as far as I know, he, he, well, he sells silver. So there you go. That's an agorist business. Um, so he's, he's got his, um, you know, he's, he's got his, um, what's the thing? He's got his hands in a lot of buckets or whatever. <laughs> I've got the right, um, metaphor. So I have a lot of respect for him, even though I think he's a little bit misguided. And this is the movement at a crossroads video that he did recently. And we could go one of two ways. One would be the way that we have always gone. Since the time of Mises and Hayek, of Rothbard, of the founding of the Libertarian Party in the 70s, we could go the route of advocacy. We could go the route of education and of pointing out the fact that, yes, we are getting screwed. And we could stop and say, well, we're getting screwed and, and gosh darn it, we should make sure that people know about it. And you know what? There's a, a problem with this approach because there is only one thing worse than ignorance, even deliberate ignorance, and that is outrage without action. And the second way this goes is to stop talking and to start acting. And while we can preach on about how many Americans are really more libertarian than they even know, than they identify themselves as, and for all of those who are waiting for leadership from the movement, they're not going to follow you keyboard warriors to the hell of fighting the state. They're not going to follow the blowhards into battle. They're going to stay on their couches. You want to see you want to you want to be libertarian and be right about everything while the world goes to hell. Good for you. You want to tell me that that coercion is wrong and that force is wrong and that fraud is wrong and that when the state kills children with drone strikes, by golly, we have we have a duty to to say something about it. Really? I thought on one hand, I you know I just nice job at it. Nicely done. Because, uh, and basically what his video is saying is, get off your sofa, get out there, and start doing stuff. You know, get off, get out of the talking stage or the apathy stage and get into the doing stage. And uh, I was like, yeah. Because you know what? I wrote an article, uh, let's see, last June, a year ago, called The Elephant in the Libertarian Community. And I said, there's an ugly elephant in the libertarian community. It's not the Ron Paul Republicans. It's the, dis it's the, the disgusting ch chasm between word and deed. And it, basically, this is uh, kind of similar to what Adam said in his recent video. Um, basically saying that, you know, we, we, we're really good at talking the talk, but we're not very good always at walking the walk. For example, we rail against taxes, but how many of us are resisting taxes? How many of us are not paying taxes? And this is one thing that impressed me about Adam in 2009 at the Liberty Forum because he went out, went right out in his talking uh, slot and said that he does not pay taxes and he thinks everybody should not do it and we should talk openly about it. And uh, that's a little bit of a taboo in our community because people are scared. Rightly so. The IRS can ruin lives. Um, but I'll talk about my strategy for that in a future one. Uh, also, in my article, I said uh, the people who have a job and are not self-employed, or at least not trying to be more self-employed, are not um, not walking the talk. Because uh, basically, you know, if you work a job, your time is not your own, and your paycheck, twenty to thirty percent of that, goes straight into the federal coffers to fund everything that we're working against. Especially people who work at um, like defense contractors or work for the government itself, um, you know, you're you're greased. You know, I don't care what you're talking about. You're greasing the wheels of the machine that is crushing me. Um, you need to cut it out. You know, I mean, I don't. You know, it doesn't make sense, especially with, for people with a family, to be like, you know what? Tomorrow I'm quitting my job. That that doesn't make sense. You need to find. 
it needs you need to have a transition plan and i'll talk about that in a future episode um let's see people another thing i talk about in my article are people who are only using federal reserve notes who aren't making an effort to use gold silver bitcoin litecoin stuff like that uh you know that's not hard um and if you have a job most likely you have a little bit at least a little bit of disposable income you know go out there and buy some silver and trade in it go out there and get some bitcoin and trade in it uh you know let's get it moving um, and inactivism is the last point that I kind of took uh, issue with in my article last June. Inactivism is when people don't, don't step up to fill those leadership positions. For example, in uh, 2010, when I was doing the We Won't Fly campaign with Jim Babb, um, f- you know, demanding dignity, that the, the TSA treat people with dignity in airports, um, that just snowballed immediately. I mean, it was three weeks of nonstop mainstream media interviews. And uh, we had mainstream media come to us at, and, uh, from different places all over the, co- the country. And they wanted to speak to our local representative, you know, in Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, or Seattle, or whatever. Uh, they didn't want to talk to Jim or I, because we were based out of uh, someplace else. They wanted to talk to our local representative. Uh, because part of the thing was we were organizing uh, demonstrations at uh, around 30 airports around the country. And being the We Won't Fly local representative not only offered you a chance to do some meaningful activism, but it got you camera time. Uh, it got you an interview, a mainstream media interview. And uh, that was pulling teeth. That was like pulling teeth to get people to do that. You know, I'm like, hey... You know, your uh, local main, you know, local NBC wants to interview you about a libertarian talking point. How about it? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just not that interested, you know. You know, come on, step up. I mean, you know, do you believe in what you, what you say you believe or not, you know? Prove it. I mean, you don't have to prove anything to me, but prove it to yourself. So, um, you know, Adam made some similar points about, you know, uh, for example, he says libertarians are lazy. It's time to stand up. And uh, I don't necessarily disagree with some of the things he said, although he paints a rather uh, brutal, what I consider a false dichotomy. You know, basically he says either you're uh, fat and lazy and sitting on your couch with a remote control in your hand, (laughs) or you're out there with me carrying your guns and marching on state or national capitals, yeah, being all alpha. And um, th- that's a false dichotomy. That's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it's more graded than that. You know, as I, as I laid out the different steps that I mentioned um, earlier, the kind of the steps of personal evolution that I've seen. And I think I laid out six, six stages. And there are even more stages than that. Um, those are just you know, the main six as I see them, you know, so there's probably even some false, uh, there wouldn't be dichotomies because dichotomy is just two, but sexchotomies. <sighs> sexchotomies. Ooh, I bet your ears perked up at that. Maybe we'll have a future episode on sexchotomies. Anyway, yeah, it doesn't sound very good though. It sounds like uh, when um, when men get their, their ducts snipped so they can't uh, have have children, make a woman pregnant, forget what that's called. But anyway, um, yeah, I I didn't think that was really, that wasn't fair of Adam to say the people are either fat, lazy on the sofa uh, or out there with him. Yeah. Um, But, but his point was valid. More of us need to live our principles and we need to do it not in a with way where we not in the withdrawal voluntarist withdrawal way where we go out and live in a rural area where you know we produce all our own food as as admirable and valuable as that is I'd never leave the farm and obviously I'm exaggerating here but in an agorist way where we go out and engage with people um, whether they're the kind of people we like or not because we we do need to be tolerant liberty is about being tolerant it's about freedom. Um, and so, 
Yeah, so I, I agree with Adam's point, but, um, you know, it was a little bit too alpha for me, I guess. So, um, you know, in, you know if, if you're not at the stage where, you know, stage six, you might call it, where you're out there creating alternatives and solutions and whatnot and engaging with other people and, um, you know, I'm tooting my own horn a little bit. Maybe it's a little too alpha. But uh, I, I'm at that stage because I'm doing stuff like Shield Mutual, the Agorist First Defense Agency. I'm doing stuff like Agri.io, the online Agorist Unconference, and um, probably some other stuff. I don't know. Those are the two that come to mind. Why aren't you at that stage yet? What do you need? And uh, I don't want this to sound accusatory like, get off your sofa, you fat ass, and get to stage six. No, because I want to help. I want to help. You know, maybe you totally disagree with what I said, but, you know, uh, so, you, know you can tell me why. Or um, maybe you, you, you think, maybe you sort of agree with me, but you're like, you know, I don't know how to get to stage six. You know, I'm at stage zero or one or two or whatever. I just don't know how to get there. I don't know how to move on to the next stage. It's too big for me. I'm a little scared. Yeah, I'd really like to know how I can be of assistance to you because, uh, you know, and I, I've said in a previous episode, I think, that uh, I'm a leader, but I, I view the function of a leader as, uh, and I think this is a Ralph Nader quote, oh, Ralph Nader on a libertarian podcast, but um, the function of leaders is to create more leaders. And, uh, and I, I think this, I don't think Gandhi said this. I'm a big fan of Gandhi, but it's kind of Gandhi and the function of leaders is to serve. You know, the function of a leader is not to be up there claiming all the glory and doing all the interviews and being all alpha and accumulating all the rewards. No. My role is to serve. Um, you know, and that's a Christian thing too, I think. I mean, that's a Jesus thing. You know, he wasn't out there being like, you know, let's attack. He was all being out there, hey, let me wash your feet. Yeah? Uh, and I may be washing feet before this is over. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, how can I serve you on this topic? How can I help you? What do you need to move up to the next level of activism, of living the liberty principles or your principles, you know? Um, because all of us are different. You know, my liberty principles are different from your liberty principles. A lot of people in this community are very, you know, get the gun in the hand and, uh, you know, anybody steps foot on, crosses the, my property line, I'm going to shoot them. You know, uh, that, that's an exaggeration, but I'm more cooperative. And I saw a quote recently from um, Gary Johnson. And uh, let me see if I can uh, pull up that quote about how people, libertarians, should not have a social program. And um, I'll see, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the image up here. Basically, li he said libertarian is about not having a social program. And, and this is where my liberty principles may be different from yours. I have a social program. And I think this is one of the unsung uh, benefits of libertarianism. We can have, we can all have social programs. Um, we can all have social agendas without it being insidious because they're voluntary. And they're about what I'm going to do for you, or you know, for you, Mr. Man who is homeless, or Mr. Woman, single mom who's not earning enough, how am I going to help you? You know, it's not about uh, you have to give more money so I can give it to him. No, it's about how am I going to serve? That's my social program, service. And uh, you know, service has become a little bit of a dirty word with uh, Barack Obama's uh, service program, serve.gov. You know, <laughs> that was. Uh, you know, telling, uh, if, whatever. Service, that's what it's about. So, uh, I'd also, I also have another video that I'd like to show you from um, when Adam Kokesh was arrested last month in, um, in Philadelphia at the Smoke Down Prohibition. And th this is, gets back to Gandhi and Satyagraha, nonviolence. When Adam Kokesh, uh, before even I get to that, 
Whenever I have talked about nonviolence in the past on Facebook or in my blog or whatever, or Satyagraha, which basically means the force of truth, it's Gandhian nonviolence, uh, basically about truth force instead of the force of arms. Uh, whenever I've talked about in the, ba in the past and sung its praises and whatnot, people have been like, you know, nonviolence is passive and nonviolence is for pussies and I'm going to get my gun and, you know, blow that status brains out and, you know, all this violent alpha nonsense. Um, what was my point? Uh, oh, and so when Adam Kokesh came out with his uh, famous, um, you know, armed march on Washington, D.C. for July 4th, suddenly it was a, a breath of fresh air as people were like, whoa, I'm in favor of nonviolence, bro. You know, what I'm, I'm kind of like, <laughs> even people who had been critical of me talking about um, nonviolence, who were like, you know, bro, I'm for, I'm for nonviolence, man. You know, let's not get violent yet. You know, that, that's not going to work. Um, and that was, that was kind of interesting. But what one, one aspect of nonviolence is that is love. And being polite, respectful, and working together as a group, as a unified group, which can be hard for some libertarians who are so individualistic. And that's what... <laughs> Excuse me, and that's where ego comes into it again. And a, gr a prime example of this was at Adam Kokesh's uh, May 18th arrest in Philadelphia, where as he was, there were probably 100 people there. And as he was being arrested, basically 100 individuals all started booing and yelling and gathering around the cops and ins insulting them or criticizing them or whatnot. What are you talking about? What did I say? Fuck the law, smoke it anyway. Fuck the law, smoke it anyway. Hey, bring it in. Everybody get closer. Show some love. Come on, we're going to make it difficult for the police here. Hey, I'm being assaulted. I'm being assaulted. I'm being assaulted. I'm being assaulted. I'm being This is not compatible with nonviolence. This is not compatible with effective uh, liberty activism. And it's not just there. I've seen it everywhere. Um, nonviolence is about love. It's not about hating and yelling and screaming and criticizing. You know, if you watch the Gandhi movie, which uh, Gandhian experts have told me is uh, really realistic about how the uh, Gandhi performed his nonviolence, people are silent. Um, you know, Satyagraha, truth force, it's not about talking anymore. It's about doing. It's about showing the force of your truth. Frankly, it's incredibly disappointing when I see activism where everybody's yelling yelling and screaming and criticizing and f walking along next to somebody and screaming questions and accusations at 
state bureaucrats because nonviolence about, is about using the power of love and truth to reach the oppressor's heart. And uh, you're not going to do it by yelling and screaming at them and getting all up in their face. It's just not going to work like that. Um, we need to set aside our own individual egos and our own individual need to be right. We need to cooperate. We need to, and, and we need to train. We need to organize. Um, everybody doing their own thing, coming to activism events with no preparation is uh, understandable. But that's not going to get us to the next level. It's just not. And I have uh, another video here of a uh, march that folks in Philadelphia, friends of mine, did just a few days ago where um, a city councilwoman and, you know, just city council and whatnot are using eminent domain to steal people's uh, homes and businesses in Philadelphia. And I think this is very admirable what these folks did because they marched in a um, neighborhood in Philadelphia with a bullhorn and everything to the city councilwoman's house, being quite loud and whatnot, um, and confronting her about the fact that she was stealing from uh, these, these folks, these f folks who aren't rich. These are just regular working class people as far as I can tell. Uh, confronting is confronting an oppressor is an important part of satyagraha of nonviolence. It's about speaking the truth. It's about going up to the person and saying, "You are stealing. You are hurting. You are doing something that is wrong." And I especially thought it was powerful that they brought a child along, who spoke to the woman and said that you you know what you're doing is wrong. Uh, but at the same time, there was an outbreak. Instead, you know, there are about 20 or 30 people speaking to one person. 20 or 30 protesters speaking to one city councilwoman. And at first, uh, it was just one person who was speaking to this lady. But then when she said things that were uh, unpleasant to hear, that were, um, you know, slick status talk, Everybody started talking at the same time. And uh, one young lady whom um, I respect, um, you know, I, I've, uh, I don't know her very well, but I've seen her in other situations, and um, I have a lot of respect for her. She's a doer. Yeah. She got up in her face, in the face of this councilwoman, and it was, became, it almost looked like, you know, a cat fight. I'm sorry, but that's it's what it looked like to me. Faces close together, yelling at each other, visibly agitated and angry. And that's a lack of self-control. And that's not love. And that, that's not nonviolence. And that's not helpful. And having 20 people talking at once, uh, how can you possibly expect this lady to, to respond constructively? How can you even expect her to hear what you're saying? That's why we need more leadership, more organization, and more cooperative working together in our community um, you know event, a confrontation needs to have a designated spokesperson um, it's it's not going to work with 20 people talking at once that doesn't mean you have to give up your individuality and become part of a collective it just means we have to cooperate and you know what that's what we're made for that's our one of our prime evolutionary advantages that we can communicate and cooperate and work together um, because when we work together, we're more powerful. 20 people working together in unison in an organized way, trusting their spokesperson to get in the points that they feel need to be gotten in, that's way more powerful than 20 people each talking over each other. Um, yeah, so I think that's a very important point. And I see this so often. I see this everywhere. I even see this in, in, uh, in, in Keene, uh, Keene, New Hampshire videos, which is um, allegedly the home of the peaceful evolution. Um, you know, allegedly because 
Not everything that I see coming out of there is particularly peaceful. And actually, to comment on uh, the Rich Paul case up there, who's um, a guy that I know and I like and I respect a lot. He's a doer. Uh, he was recently convicted of um, selling marijuana. And um, there was an aggressive, he was tried in Keene, uh, as I understand it, there was an aggressive effort to use jury nullification there because it had, been, it had been used in Massachusetts, of all place, successfully the year before by Pete Ayer and uh, Adam Ademo Freeman. There was a, an aggressive effort to do it in Keene. And uh, there's video of the jurors coming out and basically giving excuses about why they didn't, why, why they voted to convict Rich on a victimless crime. And at one point, he was facing 81 years in prison for that. Uh, and basically, my takeaway is it that the people in Keene, for using these uh, very confrontational, stri taking a strident attitude, not using love, the love that's behind peaceful evolution, could have made history today. Um, they have basically el alienated, as far as I can tell, the community there in Keene. And um, this, is, this is Satyagraha 101. You have to okay. use love and set aside your ego to get people on your side, to show people your human worth. You guys could have um, and in order to show people your basic human worth, you have to be a person of basic human worth, a worthy person, a worthy person of worthy of respect, uh, dignity, empathy, sympathy. And I think that in Keen, um, you guys may have overlooked that. Um, and you may want to try to salvage that in the future. Were they threatening you? No, but I feel the law, like you, um, you think the law is wrong? So basically my takeaway is, uh, you know, we need to organize more. We need to take some lessons from the left. Uh, we need to stop being so individualistic when it comes to activism. We need to be able to work together and cooperate. And um, as a parting thing, there's an example of this kind of attitude that, that's characteristic of an early stage libertarian, in my opinion, where the person complains but isn't willing to do anything. A person uh, that I won't name, because they've been through some tough times, on my uh, Facebook friend, said, um, basically complained, I, I'll read it to you. The dog situation here in the X town is ridiculous. So many people keep a bunch of ferocious dogs and don't even take care of them and often run the streets. I got attacked today by nine dogs running loose and both of my legs are covered with bite marks. I didn't call the cops on the decrepit ghetto house that owns them because I'm not a snitch. And the next time this happens, and I'm sure it will because I'm always in the kajis, streets i'm going vigilante 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 had i been a little kid i might have been killed seriously what would y'all do about this and um i offered to help him i said here was my suggestion collect evidence aggressively your story photos of the bite marks videos of the attacks video of you giving your testimony create a website for it issue letters to the people responsible you don't want the government to get involved but you can't remain silent either if the government gets involved as a result of your speaking out, that's not on you. Encourage other people in the community to speak out about the problem and put pressure directly on the people responsible. Specifically encourage people not to talk to the government about it. Issue press releases to media so that consciousness can be raised. Interface with local shelters to see what they can do. Educate people about how to defend themselves from dog attacks. Let me know if Shield Mutual can assist you. I'd actually like to. Because Shield Mutual defends people from aggression using public relations. Uh, and not all aggression is committed by the government. This is an example of non-governmental aggression. I would love to have a test case of how Shield Mutual can help defend people from private aggression. But uh, basically this person doesn't want to do anything about it. So uh, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, come on, come on, man. It's kind of like a come on, man moment because he went so far as to speak out, which is admirable. I, I admire everyone who speaks out. 
And is, he even went so far as to ask people for ideas about how to do something about it. And, um, you know, basically, I left off the thread at a certain point, but up to where I got, nobody offered anything really constructive and libertarian compatible as to how to address it, except for me. But he rejected that. He doesn't want to do it. He doesn't, he's not going to do anything about it. And I find that incredibly sad um, for a person to reach that level but then turn away. Because basically I was offering to do a lot of the work for him to help, help him with this. Don't be that person, you know. Speak up, ask for help, but then take that help, you know. I, w I wouldn't offer help if I wasn't actually prepared to do it. And actually, um, you know, this is mark the market at work. I have a financial incentive to do this because if I can prove that I can help people with private disputes like this, then that's more customers for me. Paying me $50 a year. Well, anyway, that wraps up the uh, podcast, uh, the video blog for today. Um, I'd like you to call me with your questions and leave me a message. Leave me a voicemail with your question. The number is 641-715-3900, extension 255-888. Give me a call. Leave a message with your question. I will most likely play it on the show and answer it. Uh, please don't email me with your questions. Please don't uh, comment on the site because, um, well, I mean, you can do it if you want, but I'd really rather have a recording or you know it would be even better. Ideally, it would be for you to make a video of your question, upload it to YouTube, and uh, send me the link. That would be the absolute maximum. So uh, I just want to say uh, thanks for watching and listening. I hope you have a great day. Um, you know, we all have our own private uh, battles, which are I inevitably internal battles. Uh, you know, uh, I've had hard times in my life. I'm the survivor of uh, vicious child abuse. Uh, I lost a parent at a young age. I have experienced uh, severe financial difficulties. Um, you know, I've spent time in prison, not very much. I've spent uh, time under house arrest. I've had a son who was very close to dying at one point. Perhaps I'll share that story with you in the future. Everyone has troubles. But in the end, it's not about the trouble itself. It's about how we react to it. We can control that. And uh, through my uh, podcast, video blog, and you know what the stuff I do, I'd like to serve you in helping you to become better at reacting to trouble as well as become better myself because obviously I haven't perfected this stuff. So just try to keep that in mind today, you know, when you run into to troublesome things that, um, you know, this too shall pass and it can pass faster if you're able to master your reaction to it. Have a great day. Um, smile. And I'll have another episode for you really soon. Get protected today at shieldmutual.com.